2023. And I was thinking about calling this season two, or do I just add on an episode number? So I'm, I'm kind of debating now. I think I'm just going to call it another episode because then it, I think it makes it look like you've done more if you just keep counting the numbers. But um, anyway, I believe this is episode number 16. And I'm your host, Andy Kriebel. I'm the global head coach of the data school. And I created this podcast to help introduce you to influential people in the space of data. And today I'm talking with uh, Trevani Gandhi. Trevani is a data scientist, thought leader, and advocate for responsible use of AI at Data IQ. So thank you very much for joining me today. I've got lots and lots of questions for you about AI. Thanks so much, Andy. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> yeah, so I, I talked to Carol Aramenko about this um, a few weeks ago when I interviewed him. And, and one of the things that sort of, I don't think bothers me is the right word, is uh, kind of, you know, are people abusing arti you know, uh, artificial intelligence? But I think before we get to that, we first need to get your definition of artificial intelligence or AI. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. How would you define it? Yeah, so it's actually interesting. I think that term AI is really broad, um, which is yeah, exactly. good and bad <laughs> in, in that sense. Yeah, and I think, I think you have to differentiate it based on the use, right? I think like the idea of artificial intelligence, traditionally we've thought about it as like robots and Terminator and all of those kind mm -hmm. of like sci-fi kind of things. But actually a lot of businesses, a lot of enterprises are using data science, data analytics to actually drive value back to their, to their business and to their customers. Mm -hmm. And that in itself too can be thought of as a form of artificial intelligence um, where you're extracting insights from data. So the term I think is intentionally vague uh, and it can fall into a number of different categories based on the kind of expected use of it, but it's easier to just kind of give it that bigger term um, so that yeah, you're not like, yeah. you're not creating a lot of noise in the marketplace, so to speak. Okay. Um, and everybody's yeah. sort of on the same level there. Yeah. But I would say that AI is generally the use of data to drive insights and decisions, or as okay. we're starting to see with things like chat GPT and all that generate new information as well in some ways. Okay, great. Yeah, that, that helps for sure. Um, and, and what do you do at Data IQ in artif with artificial intelligence? Yeah, so I'm actually a responsible AI lead at Data IQ. And I started out as a data scientist working with our clients, um, supporting our platform. So our, our platform is actually an end to end data science software that allows you to both ingest your data from a variety of sources clean it, prepare it, analyze it. And then if you want to then build predictive models or generative models on top, be able to do that and put that kind of stuff out into production. So okay. I started out as a data scientist, helping our clients put their sort of data analytic projects into the platform and scale them for, for higher value. And over time have transitioned into this role where I'm helping our clients do all of those same things, but with an eye towards the responsible use of it, towards the ethical and sort of fair use of these tools, uh, of, of our tool and their data uh, in, a, in a more safe and sort of scalable way. Okay, that sounds like another very broad topic as well. Like what does responsible mean? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. And what does it mean to you versus what does it mean to me? Uh, right. and, and actually in terms of responsible AI, I think that concept is a little less vague than maybe ethical AI. Uh, you know, we think about business ethics or company values, those things can be quite vague and hard to define. Mm -hmm. But when we think about responsible AI, it's pretty straightforward. We want to make sure that our AI is accountable, it's transparent, it's built with reliability, it's built with fairness and, um, you know, potential biases in mind. Uh, and all of that is then deployed and used in a way that is uh, creating net positive impact for okay. everyone involved. Um, that's the okay. idea around responsible AI. Yeah. And you mentioned fairness and bias. So those are big yeah. things in, at least for me, that's why I'm a bit skeptical about AI is because ultimately somebody has to program it, right? And right. you could introduce bias and I guess unfairness is probably the unethical part of it into the programs that are written to run the, to that power of the artificial intelligence. How do we cope with that? Yeah, so well, a couple of things. One is that when it comes to the ethical use of AI, right, it's not just about bias and fairness, that's a part of it. Um, but it's also 
bigger questions around, you know, does this use case make sense for AI? Do we really need to build a, uh, a robot to answer questions for us? Or can we actually just keep using the system that we already have in place and augment the human okay. who's there? So like, there's a first element of responsible AI, of ethical AI, that's about what is the right solution for the problem at hand. Okay. Um, and then once we say, okay, yes, we want to use some level of data analytics, or we want to use some kind of predictive model or whatever it might be, then what are the potential pitfalls? What are the potential harms that might come from this that we're not thinking about? Uh, and that's then where we start taking a step back and saying, okay, uh, could we be potentially replicating biases that are already existent in the way that we approach this situation or the mm -hmm. data that we're going to use to build this, this system? Um, and then from there, we kind of progress down that line. So just to start with the baseline of we're not going to just jump right in to uh, any sort of project just because it makes sense or just because we think it makes sense, but rather first mm -hmm. confirming that it's the right answer for the, the question at hand. And then saying, knowing that we need to use AI or we need to use some sort of data analytics, how are we going to do it in a way that makes sure we're not replicating biases? You know, okay. as, as you kind of mentioned, or you sort of implied, everything we do is already biased, right? As humans, that's just the nature of what it is to be a human is to be biased in some way or the other. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like we come with our own predispositions, we come with our own sort of expectations of the world. So knowing that, knowing that then our data will also reflect that, how do we start looking for those biases and saying, okay, we're gonna use a data set to predict if someone's um, going to default on a loan, let's say. Mm -hmm. Well, we know that the data that we're using is historically going to be biased because of the way that we've given out loans in the past to you know, different uh, social groups or to different genders. You know, mm -hmm. These are things that are already baked into that data. So then what do we do to prevent that from continuing down the line? Um, and that's the that's the, the thing here is that we're not really we're trying to use AI in a way that can actually augment and improve the human condition versus recreate the same troubles that we've already done as you know done without that. Okay. And what sort of quality processes are put in place to ensure those biases aren't accidentally introduced? Is there like yeah. some kind of QA process that things go through? Oh, a lot. Right. So a lot of the clients I work with that are focused on these topics now are looking at, you know, like I said, from the very beginning, looking at the data, understanding that there is going to be bias in data. And, you know, you mentioned that you're a teacher at the data school. I'm sure you teach EDA, exploratory data analytics, um, assessing your data, looking for problems yeah. with, within your data set, right? This is the same thing that uh, any, any sort of data scientist worth their salt is going to do as well. And they're going to do it with an eye, eye towards, okay, I know that historically this group has been discriminated against, or that I know that the question I'm asking is high is a high risk use case. Um, you know, it's about something like providing loans to somebody or providing mm -hmm. health treatment to somebody versus like, this is a really low risk use case. It's about determining if a manufacturing, uh, something on the manufacturing floor is gonna break right? That's a really low risk in terms of human impact kind of assessment. Right. So you're not always going to need to start with those kind of questions in mind. But when you do, when you have a very human oriented impact uh, problem at hand, you'll start by saying, okay, look, what does my data set say? I know that there's likely going to be problems because we've historically misrepresented people within this data set or within this, this problem space. Um, and you start there. Then as you start building the model, you're checking to make sure your model's con performing consistently. Right. It's not just say that it's a really great model. It has a really high ROC or it has a really great performance, but also that is performing really well for all different groups within my um, mm -hmm. within my data set. And that's something like group group fairness to say that it performs well. Uh, and then beyond that, how well how well am I actually, you know, implementing this model? Is this model in real time actually doing what I expect it to do? is that actually staying aligned with our expectations? Um, and then, you know, to your point about accidentally or unintentionally, there will be mistakes, right? There will be places where we, where we mess up, but do we yeah. have systems in place so that we can quickly pull the plug and say, hold on, we need to pull this out of production. Hold on, we need to stop letting this 
continue before it gets worse? Um, what are the monitoring tools you have in place? What are the transparency tools in place so you can pinpoint where something might have gone wrong? Um, so it's not just like a one, it's not one part of the pipeline. It is across the entire pipeline that we're implementing these checks and processes along the way. Okay. And how do you build in like morality? Like how do you, how do you take in like mm -hmm. your, your morals as a human into AI? This is where I get a little, uh, I think this is where I butt heads with other sort of AI fanatics necessarily. Okay. <laughs> uh, I don't, I don't think AI is sentient, right? AI is not, AI is not a human. AI is a tool. Right. Is your car moral? No. Right. Right. And so like, just like we don't expect our cars to have a sense of morality, unless you're getting into the auto self-driving cars, which is a different conversation altogether. <laughs> just like we don't expect our, like our regular not self-driving cars to have morality. I don't think our AI needs to be, needs to have a moral sense. It's okay. the people who are building the AI, the people who are then making decisions on the basis of that um, right. analytics that need to have a sense of morality there. Okay, and that's so like, where it comes in, right? Yeah, it's like, it, it, it's, you know, these questions of like, oh, like the trolley problem, like should our sort of self-driving car like hit the grandma or hit the young child if it has to make a decision? Those are not the kind of questions that the average person is going to have to deal with or be right. affected by on a day-to-day -day basis. You're more likely to be affected by AI that is, you know, not smart or not or not like, you know, sentient than any sort of sentient AI um, thing out there. And like ChatGPT3 is not sentient. Lensa AI, there's like all those different like um, AI art things, they're not sentient. They're not actually creating, mm -hmm. right? And so, we don't need to worry about their morality as much as we need to worry about the people who are using those tools for whatever reason or, and, you know, the ones who are also training those tools and what they're actually putting into the systems that are actually building out these, these end products. Okay. Is there any sort of general ethical code that everybody sort of abides to, or is it company by company? Um, there has to be some kind of ethics in AI, right? Yeah, so there is definitely a lot, uh, a lot of ways that we're looking at this within the field now. The first part mm -hmm. is that there are a number of regulations coming out of places like the EU, the United States, um, Singapore. Standards organizations are also creating, you know, guidelines and practices around the best principles for, uh, for the safe and sort of scaled use of AI, uh, and so. That's one place where we're starting to get actual clarity and guidelines on things. Um, mm -hmm. Things like, is your AI considered high risk, right? And that risk is, a, is an aspect of impact, right? What is the impact you're going to have on a human being with this model? Um, is that impact going to affect their livelihood? Is it going to affect the quality of services they get? Is it going to affect allocation of services they get? So those questions are the first like sort of stomping ground that we're all putting ourselves or not sorry stomping ground but i would say the first sort of frame that we're putting around ourselves um as as a field or as as a sort of like broader industry and then within that you have companies that are creating their own sort of boundaries and guidelines that either meet or exceed the regulations that they expect to be coming forward it's very similar to what you see with regulations within the financial and healthcare space already right we already have a number of examples of regulated industries and AI is starting to trend towards that as well. Uh, but because those regulations aren't yet fully implemented, companies are sort of working in that sort of border space of just meeting or just exceeding existing guidelines that are sort of suggestions at the time. Um, and so generally what I would say this though, is that anyone who's looking at the broader ethics of AI is thinking about questions around reliability, accountability, fairness, and transparency. Um, and those are very broad concepts, broad values that then get trickled down into practical criteria, practical indicators that each company is gonna figure out how to implement for themselves. I lost audio. I don't know if that's me or... 
Nope, that was me. Ah, okay. okay. <laughs> the, door, the, door, the front door was opening and I tried to mute it so you wouldn't hear it and uh, then you couldn't okay. hear me. So yeah, um, what, what are some kind of everyday examples that I might not know that are going on around me that use AI? Like for example, like our ads on Instagram, is that driven by AI? Uh, yeah, 100%, yes. Okay. All ads, targeted, targeted ads are driven by AI, right? Like I was scrolling and I spent 10 seconds longer on this video of a cat than I did on the video of a woman putting on makeup. And so now Instagram is like, well, looks like this person might be more interested in pet stuff. So let's continue sending pet stuff, right? right? These right. are examples of AI. Your recommender systems, right? On Amazon, you go and buy something and you say, hey, you might also like this because you bought, you bought, you know, right. whatever pink purse or something. <laughs> um, so I, I don't know. I, I have not bought a pink purse on Amazon, so I don't know where that came from. But, uh, you know, the idea that like recommender systems, Netflix, right? Netflix, Spotify, yeah. when they say you should watch this, you should read, you should listen to this. Um, those are all recommender systems that are based okay. on AI. Yeah. yeah. And so, I, you know, one thing I wanted to be clear about too is that we talk about the danger of AI, right? And we're talking about that in a broad sense, but there are a lot of really great uses of AI that yeah. can actually augment our lives, augment our day-to-days, as consumers and also users of AI, right? People who are right. working with AI. Um, it's just about what are the limits to that that we want to put in place for ourselves to prevent sort of more negative fallout, more nefarious uses. Yeah, so the the serving up of ads and recommenders, those feel like they can be quite intrusive at times. Um, yes, oh well, yeah. They are, they're, they're intentionally intrusive, I guess, right? Yes. So I, I yeah. had heard where um, Netflix has you know, multiple different cover images or thumbnails for movies, depending on, you know, what, what other kind of movies you like. So it'll serve up custom thumbnails. So you could go on to, you know, whatever different profiles you have on Netflix and switch the profile. So you could see a different thumbnail based on the, on that person. I think that's, it's super fascinating, but it's also like super creepy too, I think. Um, so now like yeah. in Instagram, I, I met, I flag every single ad I see as irrelevant, even though, um, you know, they might be relevant, but I do it anyway, just because I want to confuse the uh, the recommender. So now I get like super yeah. random stuff. Yeah. So it's, it's pretty funny yeah. to see what comes up when you, when you, it doesn't know anything about you. So, um, right. So what are, some of, what are some of those? Yeah. So what are some of the, you mentioned that there's some use cases where, you know, it is super useful for us as consumers. Um, and it's not necessarily kind of intrusive in that, you know, I kind of have that as a negative sense in my head that, that mm -hmm. kind of, you know, mm -hmm. recommenders. So what are some of the other use cases where it's, where it is really good for us to have that? Yeah. So, I mean, think about things that you want to, you do want actually intrusion on. So I used to use a service called Stitch Fix, right. Where they send you clothes that you might like, um, and you can then decide what clothes right. you want to buy, what clothes you want to return. So that is actually using AI on the back end to say, Hey, you pointed out that you like these kinds of outfits. We think based on that, you might also like this stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, beyond just that, why don't you try and break out a little bit and say, okay, well, you seem to be skewing towards grays and black. What about throwing a little orange in there? Do you like that? <laughs> and like helping you. A little color, I'll tell you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Well, I mean, I live, I live in the New York City area, so a little color might, might kill me. But, you know, in the, in the sort of like, pulling yourself out of those things and saying, look, you tend to skew towards this a lot of, a lot of the time. What about trying right. something a little bit different? Do you think you might be interested in that? And so in those cases, I, I want the AI to be a little bit more fine tuned and more grain okay. towards what I'm looking for. Right. Or when I'm, especially in retail use cases, because you want to find the right products for yourself. You want to find those things that might be most relevant and also be sometimes prodded towards something new. Yeah. Um, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. And even in cases that are not necessarily retail, let's say it's um, things like telecom, right? To say like, hey, I'd like to uh, figure out if, if you know my customers are going to churn, and if they're going right. to churn, I want to get I want to get ahead of that and give them an offer, give them a discount so that they stick with me, right? right. That's still right. not necessarily a bad thing, right? Right. Again, right. it's all about how do we then make use of that, um, right? And then, of course, there's AI for good, which is something we haven't even touched on. But there's pro uh, groups like the Ocean Cleanup that are mm -hmm. actually using AI and computer image technology to remove waste from the ocean, remove plastic waste from the ocean. 
How does so, that work? Yeah, it's actually really interesting. They use uh, image satellites to figure out areas that are more densely populated with um, sort of below waste. the below the yeah. surface waste, and then send out trolley trolls trolls to so actually the, the, like nets, yeah, the nets to actually get waste out of the ocean. And so you're targeting their where they're actually sending their, right. their sort of. Um, ships and everything. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that, yeah. that's super interesting. I, you know, you I, you hear of these stories of these boats going out and doing this stuff, but you don't ever really know. Oh, did they just pick this random spot in the middle of the ocean? Well, obviously right. not. There was something behind that, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. So great. So in in social media, the recommenders tend to still introduce content that we're interested in, right? The same mm -hmm. content over and over again. That can keep us in a bubble, and that gets yeah. dangerous. So, yeah. you know, things become these megaphones like we see in politics, you know, it's getting worse and worse because social media has provided these megaphones for people and it, it intentionally prevents you from hearing other opinions, right? It wants mm -hmm. you to, because you stay engaged if it's content you're used to seeing, right? At least mm -hmm. I guess that's the theory behind it. But isn't that like wrong? Yeah. <laughs> like how does somebody not like, what I don't understand is how does somebody create something like that and feel like that's okay? Yeah, Especially I mean, this when is, they see the harm that's being done. Yeah, well, but the, so this is where then we're now looking towards regulations, looking towards um, external groups to actually step in and regulate in some cases because those social media groups, those bubbles that are being created, those also generate revenue for the companies, right? Right. Um, you know, and and the big sort of the big names in social media, the Facebooks, the Twitters, you know, et cetera. For them, it is about continuing to get your engagement and get you yeah, to keep totally. staying yeah. on and staying clicking. Um, and until regulators actually step in and say, look, you need to actually scale back the amount of sort of bubbling that you're doing, um, that's that's not likely to change, right? Like there are a lot of groups, yeah. a lot of like ethics groups, a lot of sort of safety, trust and safety groups at many of these bigger social media um companies and it's a good thing like these are groups that are actually trying to say look we need to make sure that what we're recommending isn't necessarily dangerous or that we're making sure right. that we're recommending things that create branches create new forms of exploration uh for the for the user but it is also something that has to be thought about at a bigger picture right and that like it's like it's again with any new technology until we actually get some sort of regulations and guidance it's going to be hard uh, to actually get all of the players to buy in. I think, you know, thinking yeah. back to, again, my clients, my clients that are in enterprises, in businesses, like, you know, banking and healthcare and uh, finance and telecom, they're actually thinking about this because their customers are, are, are right there, right there in front of them. But when you think about the big tech guys, right, their customers are worldwide. They right. are, you know, trying to just continue to expand out. And so for them, their motives might be a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where you do need regulations to come in. And that's why we have things like regulations on cars, again, or trains and planes yeah. and automobiles. Yeah. So. But I guess the regulations can't come in until the politicians and the regulators actually understand the technology. So if the technology yeah. is continuing yeah. to advance, how are they ever going to catch up to be able to regulate it in the first place? Yeah. Yeah. So this is something we're starting to see more of um, where... Okay. Places like the US, the EU, et cetera, they're actually building out offices of artificial intelligence or okay. uh, offices of advanced technology. And they're actively reaching out to stay in touch with academics, in touch with standards organizations, and keeping abreast of those situations. I think this is one of those places where now the, the sort of traditional, like slower pace of policy is going to have to learn to be a little bit more adapt adaptive. Um, and stay to stay on their toes. But the I think the thing is is that we'll always lag a little bit, right? Um, yeah. and and I think that you know, on the other end of that, us as consumers have to start being a little bit more savvy towards, okay, what is this really doing? What is this AI really doing here? You know, like you say, you purposely go in and mess with the Instagram um, ad tracking, you know, <laughs> Being a little savvy there to say like, look, I recognize that this is AI. I recognize that this is like a bubble that I'm being put in and I don't want that actively. Right. Um, I think that that's something we as end users should also be doing. Okay. So they're, they're potentially taking advantage of 
people that don't understand that. And those are the people they can keep in those bubbles, I guess, and keep engaged because of continuing to serve up, uh, serve up content that, that keeps them in that bubble. Um, what are some exactly. of the big dangers of AI? Yeah, well, I think we've seen some of the bigger dangers already, right? These are things like um, algorithms that unintentionally discriminate against certain groups right. or the social bubbles that, that kind of come in, um, mm -hmm. as well as the, the things like the like actual costs of, of running big AI models that can actually be impactful for the environment. Some of those, I mean, some of those dangers are things that we're, we've seen a lot of in the past I would say four to five years, you know, mm -hmm. starting from 2016, early 2016, I think we started seeing a lot of those dangers. I will say this though, having seen those dangers, there is a really strong movement now towards addressing those dangers and calling those dangers out. Um, like I said, the average person becoming more aware of that, those limitations and companies themselves saying, look, we don't want to be complicit in this. We want to do better. Uh, we want to actually push mm -hmm. towards this. And this is why, Again, like I see a lot of clients coming to us saying, we want governance programs. We want um, responsible right. AI frameworks. We want to make sure that what we're doing is staying aligned with what we've mm. set out. And there is a, a marked, a, you know, a notable shift that I've seen in the industry over the past four or five years away from, you know, move fast and break things to move at a more reasonable place, pace <laughs> and do it in the right way. Well, it sounds like morality and ethics are then being brought into it. Yeah, into the humans, right? The humans yeah, themselves yeah. are starting to realize that, hey, we we probably should think about this as another tool, as another aspect of ourselves. Right, that not we're the not, solution. Not the solution, right, right, right. right. Okay, exactly. so it should be, yeah, it should be augmenting our decisions, not making our decisions. Yes, yeah, okay. actually, I wrote an article, I actually wrote an article about this, um, you know, the premise being, no, your AI isn't sentient, but you should act like it is, right? Because if you treat your mm. AI just like any other human, you'll realize that, hey, this is also flawed. This is also biased because every human is also flawed and biased. And so we should then take the sort of outputs of AI with a grain of salt, so to speak, or with okay. consideration and bringing it into a group sort of decision and not like mm -hmm. a sole decider of some sort of aspect of of someone's life. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you could change one thing about the way that AI is used, um, mm. maybe the way that, yeah, uh, I'll just leave it really broad like that. If you, if you were in charge of AI uh, and you could make one decision that everybody has to abide to, what yeah. would that be? Uh, the first thing, I mean, the biggest thing would be any decision, any aspect of whatever you're seeing on a screen Let's put before you, if it has been based on the use of AI, there needs to be a giant label. This decision, this video was shown to you because of an AI recommender system or because of some sort of mm. AI system. And then, you know, explain to me why. Like, okay, fine. You've used AI to show me this, the 10th cat video of the day. <laughs> why? Like, why this video in particular? What about right. the model? what decision, like what data did the model use to determine that I wanted to see specifically this cat video versus that one? That's super um, interesting. Like maybe a little information theory. icon that you can click on yeah. if you want to learn yeah. more or something, yeah. Yeah, one thing yeah. I really like frustrates me about the chat GPT, which I don't know if you've played with it at all yet. Yeah, but it's like, pretty funny. It's pretty Again, funny, right? But the thing that really frustrates me is that I wanna know how it, like why is it giving me this information? Like how did it create this information? Tell yeah. me. How, what data sources you used or what like were the various components that, I mean, that's not easy, right? These are very complex algorithms. And so yeah. like, I'm not saying that it's easy to do by any means, but I think it could be really interesting for people to say like, look, here's your information and here's a, uh, a wiki list of references that I used for this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, that's really interesting because ult ultimately it's based on data has to be based on data. It can't just make things up. So where is this database? And you know, uh, you know, any decision that that businesses make now has to be based on data for the for the most part. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm just going to have a quick look through through a couple of my questions here because we've actually covered a lot. Um, <laughs> so you're you're a thought leader, um, an advocate for the responsible use of of AI. Um, 
what do you do personally to help spread the word about um, the responsible use of AI and to help ease our fears? Yeah, uh, it's a lot of a lot of this talking to folks and explaining to them, you know, baseline like, have you thought mm -hmm. about this versus have you thought about this? And so, like, I actually inter I interact with two different kinds of folks. Like, I interact with folks like yourself who are like, hey. AI seems really dangerous and I wanna be careful here mm -hmm. and I'm very skeptical. And for those folks, it's like, well, look, you can still get a lot of value out of this and you can still do it right. Here right. are the tools that, that we have to offer. Um, here are the ways that you can go about thinking about things, um, you know, planning in the right way. And then, you know, using our tooling at DataIQ to actually implement those things. That's one set of, of folks that I talk mm -hmm. to a lot. Uh, and then there's another set where it's like, AI is amazing and we should use everything and let's like, let's throw the most complex algorithm at the most simple problem. And those are the folks that we have to like step in and scale back and say like, okay, that's great. Let's use AI, but have you thought about X, Y, Z? Or I remember one time I was on a call with a client. They were really excited about some sort of um, insurance marketing or sorry, insurance pricing algorithm that they were showing me. And I said, this looks, this looks great. Can you just click over here? within our tool, there's an aspect of the tool where you can do subpopulation analysis to say, does my model perform equally well across all different populations of my, of my data set? Mm -hmm. So I said, can you just click here, click on gender and let's just take a look and see how this is doing. Turns out the model globally does really well at pricing insurance for folks. But when you break it down by gender, it performs better for men than it does for women. Right. And I said, that seems, like not great because your 50% of your clientele now is going to get a far worse deal. Yeah. Why not try and improve your model so that everybody gets a good deal. Right. Uh, and, and they, they were just shocked, right? Like it's not something that had crossed their mind before. And so a lot of times what I'm doing is taking people's taking people, meeting people where they're at and then saying, look, have you thought about this? And just slightly changing the conversation either towards, here's how you can be safe and regulated and you don't need to be so skeptical or great, you're doing amazing things, but let's bring in a little caution. Let's bring in a little guardrails and getting people to kind of meet in the middle. Mm -hmm. And what can we do as individuals? Yeah, uh, there's a lot of things. I mean, I think your, your podcast is a great place to start because people are learning about what is data, how does data affect us? How does, you know, how do we understand these things? That's a big part of it, right? How do we even make sense of the fact that we're constantly surrounded by data and analytics and AI. Mm -hmm. That's one place, right? But then there's a lot of great resources out there now about understanding the, the basics of, of the, these problems, right? So things like um, the Coded Bias movie, there's Weapons of Mass Destruction, which is like the, the book on uh, responsible AI, Kathy, Kathy O'Neill. Um, the the number of books algorithms of of oppression um data consciousness these are there's a number of resources out there if you go looking for how to understand ai how to understand uh the responsible use of ai there's a lot of resources and i think that that's a good place to start and just being generally aware of like well what mm -hmm. is going on in front of me in front of the screen that might actually be the product of something uh that mm -hmm. i had no control over Right, um, and right. just being a little bit more critical, but not necessarily saying like, you know, it's throw bad. away all of your devices right. and run off into the woods, right? right? Like, no, we're going to have to learn be really nice, though. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it would be nice, right? But then you think about running water <laughs> and yeah. all of those other great parts of life. But, you know, but like just learning to be critical, learning to be um, a little bit more attuned to place, uh, attuned to ways that this tool in front of you might be working for you or, or against you um, and being able to, to like sort of distinguish that. Okay, yeah. So um, AI systems are uh, potentially, well, I guess and not, maybe not potentially, but they're vulnerable to, to attacks that can, um, that can like compromise their integrity. Mm -hmm. um, how do you guard against those attacks? Yeah, well, a lot of this, you know, depends on whether or not you're dealing with open source or like, you know, sort of proprietary in-house stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. So for enterprise clients that are building out, you know, large AI systems, they obviously have a number of sort of security features in place um, mm -hmm. that kind of relates to broader IT security and cybersecurity questions. Um, and then, of course, 
there are techniques within the model building phase, so within the algorithm phase that can ensure your, your models aren't subject to like sort of nefarious skew or intentional skew. Um, that's, that's one aspect of it. But then you have things like that are open source, right? Um, all of the generative AI we're seeing now, these are open source tools and preventing the misuse of that or preventing sort of the bad fake actor part of that, again, kind of depends on us. You know, people are going to build tools that anybody can use in a bad way. It goes back to the same thing with like, anybody can, can pick up the keys to a car and do something horrible with it, right? But do we have a sense of morality and a sense of ethics as as a society of like, mm -hmm. this is not okay to do. Um, and then that sort of morality is augmented by laws and regulations around you can't use AI to um, create deep fake images that spread misinformation, right? right? For example, let's let's say we could actually get regulation around that um, and be able to prosecute and implement those sort of regulations. That would be a big step forward in making sure that we're not misusing AI um, intentionally. I think Right. I deal a lot in the space of, hey, here are some unintentional, unintentional things you might be doing wrong with your AI. But like the bigger, the bigger societal questions are the intentional bad faith actors. Right. And, right. and that's something that we're experiencing in a lot of different realms, not just AI, but also, again, cyber threats, cybersecurity, bio warfare, all of those things. Right. Um, right. And that's that kind of is a bigger that's that's the question where we as like humans have to decide what do we really want to do with with this tool in front of us? Mm -hmm. Are we at risk of AI surpassing human intelligence? I don't think so personally. I'm sure that like- It's a possibility, I years, assume, right? 20 I guess, years now, yeah. someone will dig up this video and be like, haha, she was wrong. But you know, <laughs> I don't personally feel that that's the case because again, what is intelligence? What is sentience, right? Without being able to first define that, we can't right. even say, yes, for sure it's going to happen, right? Like- let's first define what is sentience, what is human intelligence, right? Um, but can't, like, uh, can't um, AI learn from itself, right? And then I, I don't think I'm explaining that properly, but it continues to refine itself, right? Or it should. Right. right. Well, at the same point though, like if I build, let's say I build a model to, I mean, AI continuing to learn from itself still requires mm -hmm. a human to say, hey, go back and retrain, right? It's not automatically choosing to retrain. Like even I could set it, I could say, hey, automatically go back and relearn stuff. Here's some more data, go relearn it. Here's some more data, go relearn it automatically whenever you get new data. Sure, sure, it's retraining itself, but that's still a decision that has been made externally, right? Like we are, we as humans program AI. Mm -hmm. Right. We say start training. We say stop training. We can still pull the plug. Um, I, I think that like sci-fi has done a number on us in terms of like, oh, the AI is in it's in the wires and it's operating on its own. Like there's still a lot of manual labor required or human labor required to actually kick off processes, to mm -hmm. build out processes. Um, and Right now, at least, there's plenty of stopping points where you would say, no, like, you're done training. Like, that's enough, right? ChatGPT, right, is built in a way that as it gets new data points, it continues to retrain itself. It's built like that. Right. At, right. In theory, at some point, someone could go in and pull the plug and say, stop. As far as yeah. I understand it. Yeah. So yeah. I don't think that, that that danger is there. Okay. I guess... A particular example that's popping in my head of, of the good use of AI is, and I'm assuming this is AI, AI that does that, is like occasionally you'll get like um, an alert from your bank that says there's mm -hmm. been unusual activity. That's yeah. stuff that's done by AI, right? That's not, there's no human like tracking every single transaction. Like, for example, I'm in the UK. If it starts yeah. seeing some weird transactions in, you know, uh, Mexico or North America or somewhere, at, you know, somehow the banks know where you are, which is another yeah. creepy thing, but you know, <laughs> but it's all based on your activity um, right. and unusual behavior. So that's an example of AI being used for good, I assume, right? Yeah, absolutely. We actually have clients using Data IQ to build fraud detection models for their clients. Okay. Um, so they say like, look, um, this is a sort of expected pattern of behavior. 
And when there's a deviation from that pattern, mm -hmm. go ahead and send out an alert. Um, and, and things like anti-money laundering also uh, fall into that. So there are a lot of really good uses of AI that, you know, on paper might seem creepy, but I think that what we're doing is, I think what we're realizing more and more is that we're moving into an increasingly digital world. And right. so what we do, our activity, how we move, our patterns, like this is all now a new part of ourselves. So the question for us then is, what are the limits that we want to put on that? And what are the aspects of monitoring that we, we're okay with, right? When right. I sign up for a credit card, I sort of implicitly sign up to say, yeah, you're going to know where I am based on where my card mm -hmm. is swiping. Um, but you're also going to know that I'm likely to not be swiping my card in Uzbekistan if I right. swiped it right. today. You know, if I swiped it this morning in New York, it's not going to swipe an hour later in Uzbekistan. Right. So right. help me out here. And like, these are those cases where we, it's, a, it's like a new social contract, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you've read any philosophy, if you've read like Leviathan and all this, like we, we willingly give over a little bit of our privacy so that we can actually benefit from other aspects of mm -hmm. the new sort of digital social contract. Right. Shouldn't we have more control over that though? What we do give them. So for example, you know, let's use your credit card example. You sign up and you, in the terms and conditions, you basically say, you know, you have, you know, the right to kind of monitor my life through the credit card. Um, should we be able to pick and choose what they can use? Yeah. Yeah. I think, and I think that's actually where we're headed as, okay. um, as we're seeing things like, I don't know if you're familiar with GDPR, but like, yeah. Whenever yeah. you go on the website now, right? It's like, do you accept these cookies? Can we track oh, it's you? It's so annoying. It's annoying, but that's actually you being able to pick and choose who gets to track you, right. what information do they get out of you? And so now it's there's a new the trade-off. <laughs> is it annoying or is it worth it, right? Yeah. And now you have a new kind of like, uh, I don't really want to like answer this question every time I get on a website, but also I want an opportunity to say, no, I don't want this. Yeah, yeah. Um, so how oh. much would you, how much would you pay personally to never see to be an automatic opt out of everything on on the internet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, that's the thing. Like, I don't. I mean, I shouldn't have to pay for that, right? I think that should. We shouldn't be, have to. But, we shouldn't have to. You but have based to on the you know, like, is, how much is the annoyance worth to you? <laughs> it's funny because, like, I mean, when I'm in and when I'm in a rush or something, I just pull up the pull up with something on my phone I'm like yeah sure accept whatever get yeah. on my face. you know what I mean and so like I think that that's also by design right it is by design meant sure. to be a little like in yeah. your face um a little annoying and sometimes so that, they, they make it so you have to scroll twice in order to get down to the right. button yeah. yeah yeah or like it just like shows it doesn't show exactly right what you, where you need it, it yeah. or the yes is where you expect the no to be whatever it is um I don't know how much I'm willing to pay for that you know to like to automatically opt out of all of all new things. Would you pay I think that like the would you pay hundred dollars? Here's the thing. If I say yes, I pay a hundred dollars, Amazon will turn it into a subscription and then it'll be a hundred dollars a year to opt out of all ads. And then next thing you know, they're gonna raise the price and say like that was one fifty. <laughs> so like this is why I, I don't think I should have no, to pay a one time fee. A one time fee. A one time fee I pay a hundred dollars, sure. Would you pay a thousand sure. for the rest of your life? Ugh. Probably not because knowing these systems, they'd find a way around it and that 1,000 would be obsolete. <laughs> and it would be like, why did I pay this money? You guys found a yeah. way around this anyway. Yeah. So I think, I think 100 is my The People are too smart. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay. Here's an example of where I think AI needs a lot of help. Mm, okay. Um, Chatbots on websites that oh, are yeah. trying to help you. Why are they all terrible? <laughs> I mean, because literally, I've never had one that has actually helped me. Yeah. You know, and I think that's about to change, actually, because large language models are have traditionally been, you know, harder to do. Um, and now with things like chat GPT, right, those models are actually improving day over day with the amount of data coming in, with the amount of advancements in the algorithm sphere. So that kind of stuff is actually going to improve. Now, what I argue is that, fine, great, use it. 
but make sure you're being very clear that this is what's happening, that you're not yeah. talking to a yeah. person, you're talking Most to a robot. Most of them do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah they, exactly. They they're, they're pretty yeah. good at that. And then you, you just go in with a certain set of expectations that you're not really going to get what you want, but you have to go yeah. through this in order to actually talk to, to somebody. To talk yeah. to, but I think that's going to change. I think that now that we're getting big advancements in these language models, um, the, the quality of those chatbots will probably change. Yeah. Okay. Well, this has been a like super serious conversation. So we need to flip it on its head and Let's do it. get, get to learn a bit more about you. Um, sure. But we, I promise I won't serve you cookies or anything in order to, well, I can bake you cookies. <laughs> but, uh, I would take cookies right now. Yeah. It's like, it's <laughs> almost lunchtime for me. Like I could have yeah. some cookies. <laughs> I absolutely love baking cookies too. So one of, one of my, one of my it. favorite hobbies. Um, oh, nice. Yeah. So what is it, what does a typical day look like for you? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, I guess like we'll be, I'll be a little. Or is there no typical silly. day? <laughs> well, there's no typical. Yeah, no, the tip, what, I think there's a typical day where it's like, get up. Like I'll be my husband. Can you take the dog out? Cause I don't want to yeah. do it. It's cold. Uh, kind of that kind of thing. Out. She's a mixed breed. So, okay. you know, you know, you can do these DNA tests for your dog. Yeah. And so I sent it in and they said like it was a boxer and husky. <laughs> But she looks nothing like that. Like she looks <laughs> like a Rottweiler. Like she has the markings of a right, Rottweiler. Right. But anyway, uh, so mine's walking around you know, somewhere. Yeah, I, I saw I saw a tail. Yeah. It earlier, so <laughs> um, no, so I think a typical day for me is really like okay, you know, because I deal with I deal with clients and I have um, colleagues all around the world. So like I wake uh, up, I have a couple different slacks to answer first. Seven thing. in the morning or ten at night. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. So it's just like okay, answering slacks, answering those things, but then. Um, doing things like this, working on thought leadership with, with like folks like yourself, um, yeah. building out custom trainings, building out um, sort of educational material, building actual solutions with my clients around, mm -hmm. okay, you have a new model that you want to put into place. Um, there's a lot of like sort of governance and frameworks that you want to put around that. Let's sit down and have some sort of um, preliminary discussions on, is this the right solution? Again, going back to like, what are the pitfalls? What are the things we want to account for? And then how are you going to actually do it? So um, a lot of what I do is a mix of talking to folks, but also building things. And I like mm -hmm. that. I get the sort of like mix of getting my hands dirty and also looking at things from a high level. Mm -hmm. What are you most um, proud of in your career? Ah, that's a good question. I think that it's, I think it's my ability to pivot. Um, I actually did a PhD in political science and left that's academia. It's quite different. I left academia in 2016. I was like, I can't do this. I can't, you know, my dissert, seven people in the world read my dissertation that I spent years on, right? So it's like, why? Well, why, why, I, why did I do this? Right. Um, but like when I was in my PhD program, I learned statistics and I used a program called Stata. Yeah. And that towards the end of my uh, PhD, I was like, I, I really want to make some nice graphs. I'm going to learn this thing called R, right? right? Which was like, so confusing for me at the time, like the concept of coding and variables and oh my God. Yeah, yeah. And then from there I pivoted into data analytics. And from there I learned Python and became a data scientist. And from there I'm now doing these big picture questions on the responsible and ethical use of AI. Like, right. I think that ability to sort of let, let myself pivot as the, the ties change has been, um, I'm really proud of that. Yeah. yeah. I bet you're good at puzzles. I love puzzles. Yeah. I'm tell. like, I've not tell met a puzzle like, that you like puzzles. Yeah. <laughs> Everything you're doing is a, coding is a puzzle, right? It, exactly. Yeah. 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 I don't, I don't do my coding puzzles very elegantly though. It's a lot of like <laughs> bashing things into place. But if, but if the puzzle pieces come back together, if it and, works. Right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> it's, it's efficiency versus uh, getting the answer sometimes. Yeah. So. It's not, it's not elegant, but it's efficient for sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What's the funniest thing your dog has ever done? Oh my gosh. Uh, she, well, where do I, there's so many things. <laughs> it's an impossible question. That's like a, like everything. Um, I think the thing that's really funny is that like, so she sits on a, a little bed that's between our two offices. I mean, like in the guest bedroom, my husband's in the office room. Okay. And um, when she's feeling like a little like under, under loved, she'll flip over onto her back, pause into the air and like, kind of like, just like, <sighs> <laughs> our attention and be like i want belly rubs right now yeah um yeah. so there's that and then one time she slept right outside of her bed because the beam of sunlight was just off center so she was just like head like on the wall like this 
just laid out, even though her bed was like literally right behind her. So I don't know. It's crazy. She's a crazy dog. We, we don't deserve dogs. That's for sure. But really, truly, we do not. <laughs> Great. Okay. One more question. And this comes from um, Kira Aramenko, my, my last guest. Um, Great. If you could, if you, and I'm going to ask you to give me a question for my next guest as well. Ooh, if you okay. could go back in time and tell your past self only two words, what would they be? Keep going. Oh, wow. Yeah. That was really a, good for that short of an answer. For that, uh, wow, that's impressive. <laughs> well, I, my, I cheated because there's a Churchill quote. Um, if you're going through hell, keep going. Right. You got to get out. Yeah. yeah. You're going, so just keep going. Yeah. That's great. Okay. Yeah. So what's, what is your question for my next guest? And I'm not going to tell you. Oh, okay. Interesting. Uh, for your next guest, the question is... It has to be a fun question, not like a serious question, right? Um, any, anything you want. Fun, fun's okay. better though, I think. Fun's better. You don't want me to be like, what are you doing to address the biases in your data set? <laughs> 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 uh, probably you don't want to ask that to your question. Okay. Um, I, always, I always do, if you could have any superpower, what would it be? Um, I know it's a pretty basic one. I don't know if you've that's asked an, that one that's, before. That's boring. That's an yeah, easy one. You, you, want something, you want something else? You want something more interesting? Yeah. Uh, okay. What was the the last meal you had that like absolutely blew your mind? Like describe the meal to me. I'm a, I'm a little bit of a foodie too. So like, I want to hear about the, the sort of like mind blowing flavors that you last experienced. Okay. Well, this has been fantastic. I've learned a lot. So thank you for that. That's yeah. one of the things I really enjoy about this podcast is I'm, I'm talking to people that I never, I don't know anything about these topics. So I'm really learning a lot. So I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me, uh, Trevani, and um, let's stay in touch. And if you could send me a link to that article that you mentioned that you wrote, and I'll put it in the yeah. show notes for everybody as well. And for, those of you, and for those of you that are listening, if you enjoyed this, please, uh, if you're on YouTube, please give it a like, and don't forget to click subscribe. And if you're listening to this on uh, Apple Podcasts or Google or Spotify, uh, please don't forget to click on subscribe. It helps me a lot and um, it helps me continue to run this channel. So thank you very much, Trevani. Thank you so much for your time, Andy. This was great. And I'm looking forward to staying in touch. Okay, great. Bye. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.